people for all humanity. And it is through the study of Torah, which is the first of all of the commandments that God gave us, that we find the means to make our lives holy. So we are committed to the ongoing study of the whole array of mitzvot and to the film, fulfillment of all of those that address me as an individual and those that address all of us as a community. But still, I can't speak for all of Reform Judaism or all of Judaism. I can only speak for Berkson, for me. And so that's what you're getting because your teacher asked me to come speak, so you're stuck hearing me and me alone. And I hope I'm not boring you here in the process. So I still understand that I'm involved in a love affair with my maker, loving God with all of my, as we used to translate the Hebrew words, my heart and my soul and my might. But really, as the Hebrew probably means, with all of my mind and with all of my body. That's how we understand what happened at Mount Sinai when God gave us, not the... Many Christians tend to assume that what God gave us at Mount Sinai were the Ten Commandments. God gave us the whole Torah. We don't even call them the Ten Commandments. We call them Aserta Dibrot, the Ten Utterances, or the Ten Sayings that the Word of God is so important that God creates simply by speaking. And by speaking, thereby it comes to be. And while God has not given a Torah, that I would suggest to you that we can all know objectively. The Torah continues to arise in that long-standing relationship that we compare to a marriage. So I promised a few words about anthropomorphism and anthropopathism. You understand? Okay. The second one. Uh, anthropopathism is ascribing to God human feelings and emotions as opposed to human physical body parts. So God becomes angry. God laughs, God cries, as opposed to the finger of God or the hand of God. In the words of another one of my teachers, Zvi Werbolowski, the issue is one of enabling human beings to speak validly both of a God in theology and to a God in prayer who is utterly transcendent. For us, the choice seems to be between saying nothing at all, which is just not how we function and daring to speak of that God in human terms, that is, in the only language people possess, to indicate that God is actively meaningful in human life, as a parent, as a creator, as a lover, as a redeemer, as a forgiving one, as a ruler. The conviction of God's spirituality and transcendence as it finally developed in Judaism was, I believe, so radical and so deep that even the most daring anthropomorphism could be used without risk or danger. I say that carefully because I could say that in a Jewish audience. I've learned that I need to be more careful when I'm with other audiences. I learned that, and I can share this part of the story, when I was teaching at Wheaton College. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Wheaton College. <coughs> Suffice it to say, it's Billy Graham's alma mater. Does that help? <laughs> it is probably the Yale or the Harvard of the evangelical movement. Do I go any further? Should I let's just let it sit at that? <laughs> I said something that the moment I said it, and I looked at the reaction of everyone there, i got to say this so carefully. It was a very, very white student body, I admit that. And I looked out and the faces became even whiter, if that's possible, after I said what I said. So, since I mentioned God as a lover, let me complete that and then perhaps turn it back to you for a little bit, because I'm not sure if I've 
done what you've asked me to do, or if I've raised more questions than provided answers. For centuries, for many decades in the American context, when we hear the phrase, God loves you, most Christians and Jews have mistakenly assumed it to be a Christian phrase. If you were home today, neither of us do this, but if, if we were home today watching certain television shows, We might see, passing through some of the channels, the Crystal Cathedral and Robert Schuller out there in California. He tells all the believers there that God loves you and so do I. And I believe that Dr. Schuller is right. God does love Christians and Jews and Muslims and all human beings. But when we assume this applies, we as Jews, this assumes this applies only to Christians, we are wrong. For God loves us with a love that is at one and the same time that of a parent and that is a lover. With a love that has blessed us, made and makes demands on us and desires us. With a love that calls to us, with a love that wants to embrace us. And while the word love is horribly abused and misused. To love is to embrace with intense affection and enthusiasm one who is less than perfect. My wife loves me. It amazes me every day that she could. To love someone is to feel perhaps irrationally deep yearning for that person. To love someone is to be willing to sacrifice for the other's sake to open oneself up to pain and to loss. And so this is how we see God. God in Genesis is our creator, our parent, the one who brought this good world into being, who freed us from bondage, who fed us mana, who protected us and sheltered us as we grew. It is the unconditional love of a parent for a child, the nurturing love which says, I am your God and you are my children. And that's what God does in Genesis in all of God's relationships with Adam and Eve and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel and Leah. Whether God prepares the infant's crib, decorates a bedroom, sews special clothes. I'm being using anthropomorphic terms here. I know this. God prepares this wonderful world and place them, places us in it. So God's love for us existed before the revelation, before Sinai. But that love broadened and changed at Sinai. At the foot of that mountain, in the middle of the wilderness, these newly freed slaves encountered God. We don't know what fully happened there, even though our tradition tells us that we were all there. I was there too, somehow, some way. But something so awesome took place that changed the course of history. And we describe it like a marriage. The moment is one of relationship, the language is that of love, the imagery is a wedding. God is the groom. The children of Israel are the bride. Mount Sinai, somehow God lifts it up. It's again anthropomorphic again. God holds it up above our head. It's the wedding canopy, it's the chuppah. And the Torah, which is God's gift to us, we accept it is the Jewish wedding contract. It's the ketubah. God so loved us, the children of Israel, that God gave us Torah. And so my task then, since God gave us Torah, God gave us Torah, I then have to do what God demands of me, even though there are many times I don't understand why God wants me to do certain things. So, somehow by doing that, God gave me Torah. God loves me purely, directly, irrationally, even with all of my imperfections. And because God does, God cares passionately about what I do, which is why I believe I have many, so many do's and so many don'ts. 
So my task is to do as best as I can understanding what it God, what it is that God wants of me. So for me then, sin is that which distances myself from others or that which distances me from my true lover, from God. The more I sin, the lonelier it gets. And then the one who loves me, God gets lonely too. That's an anthropopathism. It's not that God loves us less as we sit and grow more distance. Distance. It rather that God misses us more. So just one text. Though you be far from me, I will draw you near and heal you if you take just one step toward me. That's the love to which I respond. That's the love by which Torah was given. That is what revelation ultimately means to me. And that, in many ways, is the meaning for me of the expression in God said. Sadly, because those first tablets were shattered, I will never know fully God's exact words. Moses himself was human. Moses, too, because he was human, was imperfect, had his flaws. We read about them in the text. And so I spend my life trying to come closer to God by once again engaging in the texts of which I brought a few. So I hope that begins to help. And now I'm more than willing to engage in dialogue rather than this monologue I've been giving.